Good evening. Good evening. I was tempted to get up and say, good evening, New Hope. But I think there's a lot of people who are not from New Hope here. Who is from New Hope? Wow. Well, there you go. They're all here. Welcome, New Hope. Who are visiting? Oh, I think about 50-50. We're just so glad you're here tonight. It's the beginning of our Aussie Pastors Supporters Weekend. The Aussie Pastor is who? Actually, it's not. It's our New Hope television ministry. And we've got some exciting things to share with you this weekend. But I want to welcome, so I'm welcoming you. I want to welcome uh, Pastor John Lomachang, I said that right, and his wife Angela, is that correct? Uh, Pastor Lomachang, first time I ever saw him was singing with the Heritage Singers. And I reckon it might have even been here in Australia. Did you guys come out here touring to Australia? I think my dad brought, brought you guys out. You went to Queensland. You don't remember Queensland, do you? <laughs> That's it. We put David Asherick on all weekend. Now. Do you know where Queensland is? <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> How glad we are you are here. In fact, you're a miracle um, that we're able to get you this weekend. I think you're in, you guys are in transit from Papua New Guinea which would have been a very exciting, we're glad you're here. So welcome, we want to welcome them to church. Now Pastor David Ashrick and his wife, now I'm going to try and, Violetta. Yeah, not bad, eh? We welcome you guys. Now, I don't know whether to call you guys Americans or Australians, which one is it? Up there Aussies, he reckons. <laughs> Uh, come all the way down from Kingscliff, uh, like Pastor Loma came, very busy man. And I just feel so privileged that you've given us this weekend. And uh, I know God's going to bless us through your ministry. And we hope you have a good time here with your wife too. Uh, the kids are back home, I'm guessing. Yeah, oh, it's a good place to leave them sometimes, isn't it? Correct. But you know what? Sydney is a very romantic place, mate. We, we know that. Oh, you know, that's why you're here, isn't it? That's why we came. <laughs> well, we just welcome you and we give them a warm hand too. But there is one superstar I have not welcomed. The superstar of superstars. The greatest of the great. And you know who that is? Jesus Christ. And you know, amongst... The very gifted and powerful preachers we have this weekend, the beautiful music we'll get, the, the singing and the praise. If we can centre and focus our attention on Jesus, this is going to be a great high weekend for us all. Amen? Amen. And so I just want to pray and ask Jesus to be with us through the Holy Spirit so that you will see this weekend through this program a glimpse of him and maybe even get a little taste of heaven. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for his great love that we can't understand. And tonight we just pray that through the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, that you will be present with us. Uh, move through the music. Move through the preaching. And Lord, we just pray that everything will bring honour and glory to you. And I pray, God, that we'll leave this place having seen you clearer, Jesus. Is our prayer in your name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite Pastor Loma Kang. He's going to open our program with a beautiful uh, special item. Thank you, Pastor. Good evening, mate. It's quite all right to be here. You know, I've been here before, so I'm kind of stuck between Australian and an England accent. My wife is from Derby. And every time I try to speak Australian, they say, that's Cockney from England or somewhere from, uh, somewhere from New Zealand. But tonight, we're here to praise the Lord. Can I get an amen? amen? We just came over from New Guinea. My wife and I are here. One of the reasons why we also are excited to be here is on Tuesday, we're celebrating our 35th wedding anniversary. And uh, we're excited about that. <laughs> praise the Lord. Honey, wave your hand. And so tonight, it's so wonderful that Pastor Lloyd, I was so glad to hear him. And I know he was going to pray anyway, but I was so glad to hear him talk about the fact that we're here to praise Jesus. Don't let my blue Australian cast distract you. 
I had a white one from the States, but it cracked from all the humidity in New Guinea, and they gave me a blue one today. I'm glad I didn't choose pink. That was my only other option. <laughs> but uh, tonight we're here to give Jesus the glory. And I think about ministry, 35 years of marriage, 31 years of ministry, and there are so many times in our lives that had it not been for Christ, our stories would have been quite different. And so tonight, as I sing this song, if you think about where you were before Jesus and think about where you are now because of Jesus, this song would be the song that would bring the memory of how wonderful and merciful as a Savior he is to you. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the soul of man. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost our way. Oh, we hopelessly lost our way. Pastor John, you can oh. stay with us and oh. sing. 
Okay. All I right. feel like quite all right. I want to let him keep on singing, but we have a praise and worship where you all can sing praise to our God. And if you want to listen more of the beautiful singing of Pastor John, you have to come tomorrow afternoon for the concert. For our first song, we're going to sing Shine, Jesus Shine. Please stand. making this evening. The next song we are going to sing is Jesus keep me near the cross. You know, the best place to be is not Queensland. <laughs> Whether you're happy or sad, you are in abundance or you are in desperate need, the best place to be is near the cross. Let's sing this one. Jesus keep me near the cross.
We want to take the opportunity this week and this Sabbath weekend, each of our programs, except the concert, to give you just little two snippets of the Aussie pastor, television, internet, CD, DVD, video ministry. Now, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Aussie pastor. I like to, <laughs> when I get up there at the end of every program, I say, G'day, my name's, Lord. well, at the start I say, G'day, my name's Lloyd Groleman. I'm the Aussie pastor. And then at the end of the program, I'll say, uh, my name's Lloyd Groleman, and I love you a whole heap. And you know what, I'm looking at you guys, I'm listening to you sing, getting a little sense of heaven tonight. It's easy to love you guys, you know that? But you know what? Jesus, he loves you a whole lot more, amen? amen. And that's what people need to hear. That's what Australians need to hear. Now, at the Aussie Pastor, we like to experiment. We try to, we try to get out there and, and find out what works. Now, we've been on television. You'll find out more about that tomorrow. But we're also on the internet. And we've just started this year a every Wednesday night live internet program. Now, how many of you actually seen it? Well, let, not enough. Go to www.findjesus.tv or get onto our Facebook page, Aussie Pastor. Every Wednesday night at 7.30, we're doing a live internet program. And we're running it through this website, the Aussie Pastor. Now, God is blessing us. This website, and I don't know, I don't know how it happened, because one thing about Lloyd Groleman, he's not David Ashrick, and he's not John Lomacang. And I don't preach the house down like these guys do, but somehow God is blessing us. Amen? Amen. We have 24,000 followers. Can you believe that? But this is where it gets really interesting. Last week, and I just updated this tonight. This is an old picture here. Last week, on our Facebook page, we reached over 100,000 people. That's incredible. You You know what, Pastor David and Pastor John? The internet has opened up the gospel for ordinary people and ordinary churches to truly take it to the world. Of those 100,000 people, latest statistics, these are all, over 32,000 hopped on and looked at our videos. Praise God, amen. amen. Now this is where it gets really interesting. This is the one program that we did last Wednesday night, which was on how to hear the voice of God. We had 65, 66,000 people reach. This is current. And of those 66 for this one program, we had, if you look down the bottom, see down the bottom there how many it says? 20,000 people drop in online. Now, that's a big evangelism program, isn't it, Pastor? Here in Australia, that is a big evangelism program. It is working, and we're amazed at what God's doing. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Guess where most of the viewers come from? Well, greatest country in the world, Australia. And then who do you think comes next? Oh, you've got to love them. <laughs> we hate their rugby team, but we love them. How many Kiwis here tonight? Oh, there's only a few, praise the Lord. <laughs> but we're getting over there into Kiwi land. In fact, I'm off to New Zealand to, to preach in just a month or two. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Now, New Hope, you've been told this. I want you to... Who do you think is the next? This shocks me. We we can work this out because Facebook gives you all the statistics. Guess where our next biggest viewing audience comes from? Afghanistan. Now, be sobered. This sobers me to tears. After Afghanistan, Iraq. After Iraq, Libya. And after Libya, where's that? You know where that is, Pastor? Lebanon. And I am telling you, and I'm seeing it through the Aussie pastor ministry, that despite us and beyond us, God is doing something really huge in the Muslim world. Do you know, and I can't open up too much here and I wouldn't do it, but one of the most famous sportsmen in the Muslim world is talking to me over the internet through this Wednesday night Aussie pastor program. Amen? I mean, this guy's famous. And I think sooner or later you'll see him in Australia. He is famous. 
And I'm not saying that that's a good thing. It just goes to show how God is reaching the humble and even the, the guys in these countries who are incredible. Now, I want to show you a little bit about... This is what we do. Let's just have a little snippet. Thanks, Andrew. My name's Lloyd Grollam and I'm the Aussie Pastor and I want to give you a warm welcome to our third program in this series. Can you believe it? We're already into program three and I'm enjoying it and I hope and pray you are too. And this one is a beauty. Who is this man, Jesus? It means a lot to me, this, because Jesus is not only my God, but he's my friend. As Jesus said, wars and rumours of wars. And you burn, you burn in thousands of degrees heat, like being tossed into a volcano, you burn for eternity. It's an awful, awful doctrine. And the problem is, it's not in the Bible. You can search from Genesis to Revelation. You can search every scripture, you can search every text, you can search every word in the entire Bible. It's just not there. And then... I look at this page. God has talked to me. God has talked to me. God has talked to me. And I pray now that you'll send your Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, to touch the hearts and the ears and the eyes of those watching this program. Kind of gives you a little feel of it, doesn't it? And it's exciting stuff. Um, I don't know whether you can tell, but I'm actually losing weight. Can you tell? <laughs> Hallelujah. I have. I've gone, I'm on the health message, brother. It took me a long time, but I'm on it. I've gone from 131 kilo to this morning, what was it? 118.4. Hallelujah. And, you know, I can actually see it when I'm watching that. I can actually tuck my shirts in now. It's a, it's a good thing, isn't it? You'll be invited back. I like that. <laughs> But that just gives you a little snippet of what we're doing on Wednesday nights. I'm going to tell you more during the, during the weekend of what we do. Just these little snippets to tell you what the Aussie pastor's doing because we want to uh, share with you and see whether the Lord perhaps um, might move you to support us in this great ministry. Um, God's doing wonderful things. I want to invite our singers forward. It's an Adventist program. What do we always do on Adventist programs? Take an offering. This offering's actually not for the Aussie pastor. It's for New Hope to try and pay for this tonight. Hallelujah, amen. And we're glad you're here. And we're going to sing this. Oh, look, this, this uh, maybe we can take this away, Molly, for a sec. This song is one of the quintessential New Hope songs. True New Hope? Oh, dear, maybe New Hope. True? Calvary. Oh, I can see it. You can't. Okay. They haven't got it up there yet. So I want to invite our deacons to come forward. Um, look, uh, if you want to give, uh, we appreciate it. It helps to alleviate the costs of this weekend, which are, are pretty substantial. We appreciate it. Uh, in this church, giving is an act of worship. So if you feel like worshiping the Lord tonight and giving praise to the Lord, we're going to sing this beautiful song. I think toward the end, Lizzie, you're going to come out and lead us. We'll stand up, eh, and sing the last one or two verses. Let, let's just stay seated while we take the offering and sing this. This is this song's a ripper. Thanks, guys.
This song's a beauty. I want to sing that, that verse again. Is that all right? So we can go back one verse. The pastor does this at New Hope all the time, and they've just put up with me. So I want to go back to that second line. I want to stand, and I want to just only slow it down a smidgen. Just a smidgen. Let's all stand, because this song is very special. It's about Jesus and what he did for us on Calvary. Thanks, guys. Let's go. All right, good evening, everyone. What a pleasant surprise to see my good friend, Pastor John Lomakang, with his beautiful wife here, and uh, great to have been invited by the Aussie pastor. I've seen your program, Lloyd. I love it. And I'll tell you, it's a true story. Before you ever made mention of it, I noticed that you had lost. I thought, man, he's lost a lot of weight. You look, you look good. You, look, you have a lovely way about you on television. I should say that. I mean, I, I mean that. I'm not just saying that to, to, to flatter you. I'm not. It, it, flattery is speaking words that you don't believe are true in order to gain a social advantage. I'm not doing that. I, you actually have a lovely way. Doesn't he have a lovely way about him on television? He just comes out there and his eyes are barely open. Good eye, Mike. I just love it. I love it. Maybe your eyes are open, but I, I just, you just have this... You have a beautiful face, brother. I, just, I know that's going to sound really weird, but I see the love of Jesus on your face. And it's funny because um, Lloyd's brother, is he your younger brother? Lloyd's younger brother, Phil, is a regular in my church. He and his wife, Julie, and their children, Jack, Max, and Mitch, are locals in my church. And most Sabbaths, I will say, hey, good to see you, Lloyd. And I just, I mean to say Phil, but I say Lloyd anyway. So I'm probably going to start calling you Phil. But you actually look quite different. I mean, yeah, yeah, you're certainly better looking. That's what I was going to say. You're both about the same shape. But your shape is improving. It reminds me, I started, I started doing some cycling with his brother Phil. And uh, this is before he hurt his hip and he hurt his ankle and he said he wanted to get into shape. And I said, mate, you're already in a shape. <laughs> you're already in a shape. But he apparently wanted to get into a different shape. So uh, you're getting into a different shape. You look great. You look really great. And it's awesome to be here as somebody who's uh, a strong believer in television ministry, internet ministry. I'm just, uh, it's truly an honor for me to be here as a part of the Aussie Pastor Program I love Andrew Hunt, who's probably back there somewhere, one of the sort of masterminds in, behind the techn technical parts of the program, and just love Lloyd and the work that he does. Love is gospel-centered focus. For me, that's when I hear preaching, I ask myself the question, is Jesus being lifted up? And uh, when you hear a Lloyd Grolleman sermon, Jesus has been lifted up, and that's, uh, that's a win for me. That's a win. I can forgive a lot of homiletical sins, my own included, 
uh, if Jesus has been lifted up. Speaking of homiletical sins, I'm going to say way too much this weekend. Right? Because when you invite David Ashwick, it's funny. People invite me, and I, I travel all around the world. I get to places to speak, and they say, okay, you have 35 minutes. I say, okay, wait a minute. Wait. You invited the wrong guy. Like, I, why would you fly me to another country? Why would you fly me across the ocean and then tell me I have 35 minutes? Have you never search the Internet, scour the Internet, and good luck finding a single sermon that I preach that's anywhere near 35 minutes? I can't say my name in 35 minutes. Uh, there's no way I'm preaching a sermon in 35 minutes. Not going to happen. So uh, I have gotten close to like sort of 45 minutes, but I'm, I'm, my sweet spot is right there in about 50 minutes to an hour. So just settle in, get comfortable, and uh, we're going to have a great time tonight. What I'm going to do tonight is, uh, I think I'm speaking three times. Is that right, Lloyd? Three times. I almost called you Phil right there. So I'm going to speak three times, and uh, I suppose at some level I might start preaching and these could turn into sermons, but they're going to start as, we're just, I'm just going to teach you some things that I've been learning, things that are just really cool, great things that I've been studying. I just finished preaching an eight-part series at the North New South Wales camp meeting. Was anybody here at the North New South Wales, South Wales camp meeting? Okay. Were you in my tent? Okay. Well, good. You're going to get to hear that again. Um, <laughs> So I just finished a series there, and I'm getting ready to do a series in my church. They're not identical, but they're, they're similar. The series I'm doing in my local church, the Kingscliff Church, is titled The Seven I Am's of John. And I don't know if you are aware of this, but the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, fourth gospel, almost certainly the last gospel that was written. We don't know exactly when it was written, but probably sometime after A.D. 70, and maybe as late as around A.D. 91, 92, 93, Almost certainly the last of the Gospels written. The Gospels that came before that are what are sometimes called the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic Gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke. The word synoptic, that's the word the theologians use. It just means same sight. Same sight. And what the theologians mean when they call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synoptic Gospels is they mean that these Gospels follow the same basic trajectory. They cover a lot of the same stories, a lot of the same parables, and they basically follow Jesus, what's called his Judean ministry in and around Judea. And that's why they all have a, a similar feel. If you've read Matthew, if you've read Mark, if you've read Luke, they feel the same. But then you go read the Gospel of John and it feels totally different. Very, very different. This is not centered largely around Jesus' Judean ministry, though he does spend some time in Judea in the Gospel of John. But it's around his Galilean ministry. Jesus spends a lot of time north in Galilee. And for reasons that we're not going to get into, or at least I'm not planning on getting into, John would have certainly been aware of the Gospel of Mark, very likely aware of the Gospel of Matthew as well, and maybe aware of the Gospel of Luke. A Gospel of Luke. So, so John is sort of sitting there probably, you know, 60, 70 years old, maybe older, maybe in his 80s. And he's aware that Matthew has written his account, his eyewitness account. Mark has written his account. Luke has written his account, his sort of journalistic account. And John believes that there is still an element of the story or elements of the story that need to be told. Not that Matthew is incomplete in some sense or that Mark is incomplete or that Luke is incomplete, but he, he thinks there's something more that needs to be said. And so what he does, he does a number of things. In fact, one of the things you discover when you start to study the Gospel of John is that very much like the book of Revelation written by the same John, there are layers upon layers upon layers. And something that you may not know is that in the book of Revelation, the, the book is built around a series of sevens, several series of sevens, right? So you have the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets. There are a number of sevens that show up very significantly in the book of Revelation. Did you know that the Gospel of John is structured very similarly? It's structured around a series of sevens. There are seven major miracles or signs that take place in the Gospel of John, seven of them. Seven primary signs, and the Gospel of John is built around these seven signs. There are also seven primary discourses or dialogues that take place in the Gospel of John. Seven conversations, conversations that you'd be familiar with. Jesus with Nicodemus and Jesus with the woman at the well and a series of conversations that Jesus has with the religious leaders. And then, right at the center of the Gospel of John are a series of seven formal I am equivalences. Okay, you would be familiar with many of these. Jesus says on seven occasions, he gives seven formal equivalences that all begin with the Greek ego ami, I am. That's the Greek equivalent of I am. 
right? The very I am lifted from the Old Testament where when Moses was standing at the burning bush and God said, who shall I say, or uh, Moses said, who shall I say sent me? And God said, what? I am. And Jesus takes that I am and he uses it sometimes just by its, on its own. For example, John chapter 8, verse 58, before Abraham was what? I am. But in seven instances, just like there are seven signs in the Gospel of John, seven discourses in the Gospel of John, there are seven I ams. Does anybody, can you think of one of them? And a formal equivalence where Jesus says, I am something. Let's see if we could come up with five of the seven. Okay, j just, what is that? What's the one you said? Okay, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Very good. John 14, that's one of the formal equivalences. Somebody else, right there. Okay, I am the good shepherd. Excellent. John 10. Okay, that's two of seven. I am the light of the world. John chapter 8. Excellent. I am the light of the world. We got uh, four more. I wonder if we could get all of them. I heard somebody over here. What was that? Okay, I am the true vine. Excellent. That's the last of the I ams. Okay, I am the true vine. Please. Okay, that's a revelation. That's good. Excellent. We're looking in the gospel of John. I think we're missing um, I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life, and I am the door, right? So, so in the same way that you have in the book of Revelation, layers of sevens, and John very purposefully, very intentionally, and in a very organized fashion, builds his gospel that way, builds the book of Revelation rather that way. He does the same to the gospel. The gospel is built around these series of sevens, and uh, for a lot of reasons that we're not going to get into here, but are fascinating for theologians and Bible students, there are all of these internal evidences that the John that wrote the Gospel of John is certainly the John that wrote the book of Revelation. I mean, there's just virtually no question. The language is the same. Much of the Greek is the same. And the organization is the same. Now, whenever we read a New Testament gospel or a letter, I use this illustration quite a little bit. In fact, I used it just last night in my house when we had one of our small groups. Last night, we were studying through the book of Colossians in our house with one of my growth groups. And I used that illustration last night. I use it all the time, and I'm going to use it with you now. Much of what's happening in the New Testament is a, lot, is a little bit like hearing one side of a phone conversation, right? So if you overheard me saying, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll be there at about, oh, she can't make it. Oh, really? She's in the hospital? Oh, no, her mother's in the hospital. Oh, so she, is she going to be able to make it tomorrow? Oh, she, oh, really? Okay, okay. We'll just tell her that she and Violetta... Now, you don't know this. This is, a, of course, an artificial conversation. I'm just making it up. But what happens is when you hear half of a phone conversation, you, you're getting part of the conversation, and you're left to sort of fill in the blanks. You don't know the details. Maybe you don't know the situation. You don't know the person. You don't know their name. But you're trying to fill in the blanks. Based on what you're hearing, you infer what you're not hearing. Are you with me? And that's what basically theologians are doing, scholars are doing, historians are doing when they turn to the books of the Bible particularly in some of the letters, like we have Paul's letter to the Galatians and the first, second, and third epistles of John and Paul's letter to the Romans. We, we read what Paul is saying. That's like hearing one half of the phone conversation. And we try to imagine what's happening on the other side. We try to imagine what was the circumstance, what was the situation into which Paul was writing, into which John was writing, into which Peter was writing. Well, in the case of the Gospel of John, we don't have to wonder. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John. Go to the book of John. We're going to spend all of our time today and tomorrow, all of my time that I'll be with you, will be in the Gospel of John just looking at some really, really, really cool things. Now, I don't know how this is going to go. We might, if all goes to my actual plan, we're going to spend time in John 1. Tomorrow we'll spend time in John 3 and 4. And then in the afternoon we'll spend time in John 6 and 10. That's the plan, uh, 6 and 11 rather. We'll spend a little moment in 10. We'll see if I, if we might not even get out of John chapter 1 for all I know. I mean, we just, we're just going to sort of see how the Spirit leads. Is that all right? Now, we're going to go to the Gospel of John. Before we do that, we're just going to have a quick prayer. Father in heaven, we have every reason to believe you're going to be with us tonight as we open this fourth Gospel. Father, not just the fourth in Scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, but probably the fourth Gospel that was written. May we enter into the world of John. May we enter into the thinking of John, the purpose of John. And Father, may we come away having had the gospel of John be successful in our experience. Father, some of us are sitting here tonight. We don't know what that looks like. We don't know what that means for the gospel of John to be successful in our experience. But I pray that after tonight and after tomorrow that we will understand it and that there will be a, a harvest that will take place in our soul and in our experience as we spend time 
on this Aussie Pastor Weekend in the Gospel of John. Bless us now with your Holy Spirit is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. amen. All right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, go to the second to the last chapter of the Gospel of John. That's John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And uh, just to pick up where we left off, John, left off, John chapter 20, the last two verses. John chapter 20, last two verses. We don't have to wonder about the situation and the circumstance. There are certainly some mysteries, but we don't have to wonder why John wrote the book that he wrote. Some of the letters of the New Testament, we can only conjecture, we can imagine, we can guess, we can make a studied, uh, studied guess and conclusion as to why the author wrote what he wrote into the situation that we think was happening. But in the case of the Gospel of John, he just tells us. He says, this is why I wrote these 21 chapters. Of course, he didn't write them as chapters, but they've subsequently been divided into chapters. And if you look at the last two verses of John chapter 20, John, as it were, puts his cards right out on the table, and he says, this is why I wrote this lengthy account of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. John chapter 20, verse 30. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. He's saying this is not an exhaustive account of everything that Jesus did. It's a representative account which is one of the little indicators that John was aware of the synoptic gospels. He knew Matthew, he knew Mark, he knew Luke. He's saying, hey, look, other stuff happened. Lots of other stuff happened. There's lots of other things that were not included here. So this is not an exhaustive treatment of the life of Jesus. That would take not, not dozens of chapters, but thousands of chapters. But notice what he says in the last verse there. But these are written that you may, what's the next word? That you may believe that Jesus is, Christ is the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. So for John, we don't have to wonder, hey, John, why did you write this book? What was the situation into which you were writing it? No, John was writing the gospel, the fourth gospel, for evangelistic purposes. What kind of purposes, everyone? Evangelistic purposes. He wants you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and he wants you to receive the life that comes from believing that Jesus is the Son of God. I said at the outset that if a sermon lifts up Jesus, I can forgive a whole lot of homiletical sins and homiletical shortcomings. And that's one of the things I love about the preaching of the Aussie pastor. Lloyd is very good and he's passionate about lifting up Jesus. Can you say amen? John's doing the same thing. John says, hey, look, I'll tell you why I wrote this book. I'll tell you why I told the story of the woman at the well and the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water. All of those stories, the raising of Lazarus, Lazarus all of those stories. I wrote those stories so that you can believe. So that you can believe and that in believing you will have life. Now, if you jump, you're still there, you're still there in John chapter 20. Just jump, jump to John chapter 21. I'm going to show you how the gospel ends. The very last two, last two verses of the very last chapter of the book. Right? We're jumping ahead to the end. A lot of people do that. They say, well, do I want to read this book? And they go to the last chapter. They go read the last few paragraphs and say, is this a book, a book worth reading? Well, certainly in the case of John it is. John chapter 21, verses 24. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we, what's the word there? The next word. And we, I want you to say that word nice and loud for me. And we know that this testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. In these two verses, we have encountered two of the most important words in all the Gospel of John. Can anybody guess what they are? Well, one of them is a giveaway. I just made you repeat it two times. What's the word? No. To know. Very good. Does anybody want to have a guess what the other word is? Okay, true is there. That's true. Certainly a very important word. But it's back in what we read there as to why John wrote the Gospel. He says, I wrote these things so that you believe. That's right. Listen to these numbers. Just listen to these numbers. I wrote them down for you. The word believe, the word believe occurs eight times in the Gospel of Matthew. It occurs five, 15 times in the Gospel of Mark, nine times in the Gospel of Luke, and guess how many times in the Gospel of John? So you've got eight, 15, nine. How many times does it occur in John? 85. 85. Is the word believe important? Just to give you sort of a, a, a way of comparing just how important this word is, believe is unambiguously and inarguably the Apostle Paul's very favorite word, right? He uses the word again, believe, 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 believe. And the word believe occurs a paltry 19 times in the book of Romans. Just 19 times. But when John writes his book, 
When John writes the gospel, he says, believe, not once, not twice, not three, not 85 times. Believe, believe, believe. And what's the best known, most quoted, best loved verse in all of the Bible? John chapter 3, verse 16, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would not perish but have everlasting life. Right there in John chapter 3, verse 16, it encapsulates the very reason that John has already told us that he wrote his gospel. He said, I didn't write this for educational purposes alone. I didn't write it for, for uh, posterity's sake alone. I didn't write it, you know, to satisfy the historians or the scholars or the intellectual elite. He said, I wrote this so that you can believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that in believing you would have life. That word believe is absolutely, critically, fundamentally important to John and to his gospel. This is very likely one of the things that John was seeing when he looked at the Gospel of Matthew, and he said, yeah, that's a fascinating account of the life of Jesus. Accurate. He looked at Mark, and he said, accurate, beautiful, wonderful. He looked at the Gospel of Luke and all of the sources that Luke pulled together. He said, great stuff. But he noticed that the word believe occurs eight times in Matthew, 15 times in Mark, nine times in John. He said, man, believe, 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 believe 85 times. The second word is the word know. We just read there, right, in Acts chapter, or excuse me, Acts, John chapter 21, verse 14, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that this testimony is true. The word know is absolutely important, critically important in the Gospel of John. Here are the numbers for the word know. Uh, in, the, in the book of Matthew, 34 times, Mark 26, Luke 45, John 94. 94. More than twice as much as any other gospel. So, so for John, you have these two poles. The, the whole gospel turns and orbits on these two ideas, these two axes. And the axes are to believe and to know. Now, this is crucial. In order to believe, you have to first know. In order to believe in God, in order to believe in Jesus, in order, you have to first know about him. And so John says, I wrote this book so that you could have, as it were, an eyewitness account, a first-hand account of all of these amazing things that happened. This is not everything that Jesus did. It's a representative sample. And he said, I wrote this so that you could know and so that you could know and believe. So that you could believe. Believe what, John? That Jesus is the Son of God and that in believing you might have life. Now go to John chapter 1. We go from the last chapter to the first chapter. Not only does the word no occur so much, I want, you to sh I want to show you the first use of the word no in the Gospel of John. It's John chapter 1. John chapter 1, you would be very familiar with the first three verses, probably many, many of you, if not all of you. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. This is what theologians call the prologue. The prologue literally means the word before the word, right? From logos. This is what you say before you're going to say what you're going to say. Sometimes referred to as a prolegomena, right? To say what you're going to say before what you're going to say. And, and he begins by saying, hey, look, this whole story that I'm about ready to tell you about the word... This word is himself God. He made all things. He created all things. He's the very I am. And that, that phrase, I am, in the Greek, ego and me, will be so important in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the door. I am the true vine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. John wants you to know this is the I am. He's not merely a prophet. He's not merely a teacher. He's the I am. He's the one, he's the, the, in the beginning was the Logos, the Word. Now, jump down, just keep, we're going to come back to that in just a second. Just keep reading down. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. There we are, believe. Verse 8, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That, that was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Verse 10, here's the first use of the word no. And I want you to notice how purposefully and how creatively and how paradoxically he uses the word no. Verse 10, it says, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not, what? Know him. So, so not only do we have these two ideas here, these twin ideas of knowing and believing, 
The very end of the Gospel of John has John the disciple saying, has, has John saying, we know that this testimony is true. That's the last use of the word no. We know it's true. And the very first use of the word no in the Gospel of John says that the world did not know him. So notice what John has done. This is brilliant. It's poetically brilliant. It's systematically brilliant. It's organizationally brilliant. He's moving from John chapter 1, verse 10. He was the maker of the world. He was in the world. And the world did not. And then we're going to move through the whole gospel of John, through the stories, through the turning of the water to the wine and the conversation with Nicodemus and the woman at the well and the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda and the conversation and the feeding of the 5,000. We're going to move all the way through John 7 and John 8 and John 9. And, brrr, and when we get to the end of the gospel of John, he says, and now you know. And now you know. The world doesn't know, but you know. You now know enough to believe. John wants to get you not just, and this is what we're going to talk about tonight. John wants to get you not just to the threshold of academic assent, to get you to the threshold, not just to the threshold of intellectual affirmation. John wants to get you into the Greek way of knowing, excuse me, into the Hebrew way of knowing, not just the Greek way of knowing, which is intellectual, analytical, observational. He wants you to know as the Hebrews knew. We're going to get to that in a moment. Our point here is very simple. When John opens his gospel, he says that, that he was in the world and the world did not know him. By the time the gospel is done, he says, we know that this testimony is true. Now, again, very poetically, very intelligently, and very strategically, John then begins his gospel with a series of interactions and conversations with people who don't know anything. And, and with some people who think they know but don't actually know. Let me just walk you through a few of these quickly. John chapter 1, jump down to verse uh, 25. John chapter 1, verse 25. It says, and they said to him, this is the Pharisees speaking to uh, John the Baptist. And they said to him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Look at verse 26. John answered them and said, I baptize you with water, but there stands one among you. Look at this. Whom you do not what? You don't know. He's in your midst. He's, he's in this crowd right now. He's somewhere here. Now, what? it's astonishing enough that not only did the world not know him, not only did the Jewish crowd not know him, but what John says next is really quite astonishing. Jump down to verse 30. It says, this is, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who was preferred before me. For he was before me. This is just after he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. In verse 29, look at verse 31. I did not know him. I did not know him. Jump down to verse 33. I did not know him. So this is fascinating. What John is doing here is so strategic, so organized, so brilliant. He begins by saying, the world didn't know him. And then he, he, John the Baptist says to the crowds that are coming, this is not the same John, this is John the Baptist, says, he's among you, but you don't know it. And then John says, I don't even know who it is. He's out there somewhere, and, and God told me that the one that you see the Spirit alight upon, he'll be the one, but he's here somewhere. And then when that happened, when that, when that sign was given and the Spirit descended, he said, Behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We, we move through a series of people that don't know who he is. In John chapter 2, he goes to the Feast of Cana, and nobody quite knows who he is. This miracle takes place where water is turned to wine, and they don't know him. Then in John chapter 3, fascinating, John chapter 3, Nicodemus, just notice this with me if you would, John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, how does he address him? Rabbi, which was the traditional rabbinical greeting of the day. Teacher. He said, Rabbi, we, what does he say? We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things unless God is with him. Nicodemus thinks he knows, but the very point that John is making is that he doesn't know a fraction of what he thinks he knows. He doesn't know. John chapter 1 People don't know. John doesn't know. The crowds don't know. John chapter 2, Jesus goes to the Feast of Cana. Nobody knows who he is. John chapter 3, he sits down with the religious leader. The Messiah, the I am in the flesh, sits down with the religious leader. And he begins to speak to him in language that the religious leader, Nicodemus, was having trouble apprehending. He said, we know who you are. You're a teacher sent from God. And Jesus said, you're close, but you're not close enough. 
In John chapter 4, oh, there's so much going on here. In John chapter 4, Jesus is winding his way north, and there's a very awesome little point that John makes here because he's cleansed the temple in John chapter 2 very briefly. The point that John is making is this. When Jesus moves away from Jerusalem and particularly away from the temple, as he gets further and further from his people, he actually gets greater receptivity and less hostility. He's purposefully making this point. When Jesus moves away from Jerusalem, when he moves away from the Jews, and when he moves away from the temple, he's actually received with greater affinity and, and greater acceptance, and there's less hostility. And so guess what? In the Gospel of John, John chapter 4, Jesus sits down at a well and speaks to a Samaritan woman. And the conversation is all these textures and depth, and we're going to probably talk about it tomorrow. We'll see how this story goes. But when he sits down there, the woman at the well says to him, I know, we know when Messiah comes, he's going to explain all this stuff to us. Jesus is sitting at a well with a woman who doesn't know. John chapter 5. Jesus goes there to the pool of Bethesda, and now he's back in Judea. He's back in Jerusalem. He heals a guy that was sick for like 38 years. And when the religious leaders question him and say, where is the guy that healed you? Where did he go? Take a guess what the man who was healed says. Who was this that healed you? What does he say? I don't know. I don't know. In John chapter 9, I'm just skipping ahead here briefly, Jesus heals a man that was born blind. He's questioned by the religious leaders. Where is the man and who is he that healed you? And guess what the man says? I don't know. See, so John is telling this really fascinating story. John is, is it, it, let me just summarize it for you this way. As far as John is concerned, the world has one great big problem. The whole world has one great big problem. You want to know what the problem is? It doesn't know God. That's the problem. God came into the world. It wasn't just that they didn't know God in some intellectual sense or in some academic sense. John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he was sh rubbing shoulders and sitting at wells and healing people and turning water into wine, and they still didn't know. Nobody knows. They just don't know. But as you move through the gospel of John, when you get to the end, John says, and now we know. John wants you to know, just think about it, go back to John chapter 1. John wants you to know the word. In the beginning was the word. The Greek word here is logos. Logos, like the word biology, bios, logos, right? The word about life, geo, geo logos, the word about the earth, anthropos logos, the word about mankind, paleos logos, the word about fossils, the word about old things, the word logos, it means the definitive word about something. The word. Today, people get degrees in biology. They get degrees in geology. They get degrees in anthropology. They get degrees in paleontology. Jesus is the logos. He's the word about God. And we soften that right down. We call it theology. But there's, it's so much more than theology. Theology is like this esoteric knowledge. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. But it's a very observational, analytical um, detached way of knowing. It's a very Greek way of knowing. But what John is inviting us into, and this is where we're going to land the plane tonight, John is inviting us to know God experientially. The woman at the well didn't have a degree in theology, but she now knew who Messiah was. And the man that was healed at the pool of Bethesda didn't have a master of divinity degree, but he now knew that the one who made him whole after 38 years of sickness was Messiah. The people who ate the loaves and fishes didn't know all the details of the nature of Christ and his humanity and his divinity, but they knew that they'd eaten a sandwich from a few barley loaves and a, and a few small fishes. They know, they experience now. I'm just going to pan out here for just a moment. Just pan back from the Gospel of John, and I'm going to give you two verses that for me, from, for my money, sort of encapsulate the essence of the Old Testament. Now, that's a big statement. To say that something encapsulates the essence of the Old, the Old Testament, I mean, that's a big, big statement. And somebody might say, David, who are you to say what the essence of the Old Testament is? Look, I know it's a big statement, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. I've, I've read enough of the Old Testament. I've read enough systematic the, the, uh, theological textbook to know that this is close to not a consensus, but th this is a defensible 
a defensible answer to the question, what's the message of the Old Testament? I'll give you two passages. One is Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. You can write that down, Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. And if I started quoting it, many of you could probably finish it. It goes like this. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glories, listen carefully now, glory in this, that he understands and knows me. You boil all of that stuff in the Old Testament down. You just keep boiling it, boiling it, boiling it down to its central thesis, to its central theme, to its central idea. And God is longing to be known. He is longing to reveal himself. He reveals himself in creation. He reveals himself in the sanctuary. He reveals himself in the covenant with Abraham. He reveals himself in the prophets. He reveals himself in the oracles of God. And, and Jeremiah says that don't let the wise man glory that he's wise or the rich man glory that he's rich or the mighty man glory that he's mighty. If anyone's going to glory about anything, let them glory in this, that they understand and know me. I want to be known. Second passage is Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11. Now, this is another beautiful passage, a passage that you've heard before, probably. Isaiah chapter 11 is one of those new heaven and the new earth passages, and it sounds like this. You've heard it before. The wolf shall also dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play on the cobra's hole. And the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain. This rapturous vision of what, what the new heaven and the new earth will be look like. And then this word, for or because. Why will the world be like that? Why will the earth be like that? Why will predators and prey dwell together? Why will a child be able to put its hand in the very nest of what would otherwise be a poisonous snake? For, verse 9, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of Yahweh. So this idea of knowing, knowing God is at the center of the Old Testament, and for John, it's at the center of his gospel. You could say it this way. John's gospel is the conclusion of the Old Testament. And nowhere is this theme and this thesis on greater display than in John chapter 17, verse 3, and it's a verse of Scripture that if I began quoting, many of you could finish it, and it goes like this. And this, says John, as he's beginning to slowly bring his gospel to its grand and climactic close, all the way, we fast forwarded, all the way up here to chapter 17, we fast forwarded almost to the end of the gospel, and, and in Jesus' prayer to his Father, he says, and this is life eternal, that they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The longing desire of the heart of John and the longing desire of the heart of Jesus and the longing desire of the heart of the Father is that we would know God. That we would know Him. And this is the part we're going to get to here at the end. Not just know observationally, analytically, intellectually, but to know experientially. I'll get to that in a second. To know Think about that, that opening phrase there in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. What is the purpose of words? To communicate. What's the purpose of communication? Relationship. The reason that you communicate with anybody is because you want to understand and be understood. At the core of communication is relationship, a desire, a mutual desire to know and be known. Why is God speaking his logos into the world? Because he wants to be known. Because to know God is to love God. And yet the world into which God comes in flesh is a world, in the words of Isaiah, that is covered in darkness. Behold, darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people. So the light comes into the world. The light. And from the perspective of the Gospel of John, the true light, 
the light that gives light to every man that comes into the world is none other than Jesus. And fascinatingly, in these seven miracles, these seven I am's, and these seven discourses of the Gospel of John, God is showing up in really ordinary ways. He's just hanging out. He's at a wedding, and he's sitting at a well, and he's walking next to a pool, and he's feeding people a meal. He shows up in really human ways, really ways that you and I can easily grasp and understand and imagine. And we're going to get into some of those tomorrow. I can't wait. In the words of the Jewish rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, he says it this way. He says, the Greeks learned in order to comprehend. The Hebrews learned in order to revere. And modern man learns in order to use. Okay, now let me just sort of unpack that. He says, the Greeks learned to apprehend, to comprehend. The Hebrews learned to revere, to, to stand in awe of, to appreciate. And he says, modern man learns to, to, to get. So you can summarize this in three words. The Greeks learned to grasp, the Hebrews learned to gasp, and modern man learns to get. Okay? If you were going to give to this morning's sermon a title, it would say, Gasping or Grasping. Right? The, the, the Hebrew, the, the Greek idea, the, the, the Greek, of course, uh, the Greek, the Greco Roman world, the ancient Greeks, the desire was intellectual knowledge. The desire was philosophical knowledge. The desire was to attain increasingly uh, clear levels of, of, of clari uh, cl clarity about the nature of reality, et cetera, et cetera. So they were thinking and they were practicing uh, very uh, fine tuned skills of logic and of induction and of deduction. Right? The great philosophers Plato and Socrates and Aristotle were Greeks. They were trying to apprehend, to understand the nature of things, the truth of things, the logical sequence of things. And implicit in the Greek way of knowing is a certain detachment. We use the word skeptic. The word skeptic is a fascinating word. Uh, the word skeptic comes from a series of Greek words that, that can kind of boil down to the, the word that we get the English word scope from. Scope. What do we use a scope for? To see things that are far away. A scope. From scopine. To, to stand here and to view what is there. The idea, the whole idea of skeptic or skeptine is to be aloof from, detached from, distant from, in an observational posture. To be here observing, analyzing, whatever you're analyzing, you're analyzing literature, you're analyzing poetry, you're analyzing an economic system, you're analyzing a philosophical system. You are here, you're non-committal, you're just a disinterested observer. It's the, it's the lie of objectivity that I am here removed, I don't have a dog in the race, I don't have a dog in the fight, I am here observing from afar. That's what the word skeptine means, to observe from afar. And Greek, the Greek idea is that I'm not in the thing, I'm apart from the thing, I'm detached from the thing. Let me give you some words here. It's observational, it's skeptical, it's analytical, it's humanistic, and it's intellectual. It's based in the mind. By the way, there's nothing wrong with it. But it's only half of the picture, and in fact, it's less than half of the picture. Now, a Hebrew way of knowing is not observational, not analytical, not detached. Listen to these words. Hebrew ways of thinking are experiential moral. They involve commitment. It is a theistic view as, as opposed to a humanistic view, and it involves both the will and the body, not just the mind. So here's a, I'll give you a couple examples. If we were going to talk about a horse, a horse, the Greek way of coming to know about a horse would be to observe the structure of a horse, the anatomy of a horse, the, the build of a horse, even perhaps the nature of a horse. What is a horse's nature? What do horses like to do? Can horses be domesticated? You could write books. You could write philosophical books on the ontology of a horse. You could write biology books on the various processes of the horse. You could write anatomical books on the nature of the horse. And when all was said and done, you would say, now we have, a we have a compendium, we have a comprehensive knowledge of horse. And all the while I'm here, I'm observing, I'm, I'm the detached, I'm aware of horseness now. 
Or the Hebrew, if, if the Hebrew is going to understand the essence of horse or of hoarseness, they would get on the horse. They would, they would wrap their arms around the neck of the horse and they would put their legs around the abdomen of the horse and they would hold on for dear life. So where the Hebrew, excuse me, the Greek is seeking to grasp the horse, the Hebrew is literally seeking to grasp the horse. And that grasping will result in gasping, to revere, to be in awe, to feel the movement, to feel the musculature, not to be a detached observer, but to be a rider of the horse. We transition now from horse to woman, right? If, if, if the Greeks, in, in all of their marvelous sculpture, they looked for the perfect masculine and feminine form, and they would take the piece of rock or of alabaster or whatever the stone might be granted, and they would, they would carve out to preserve the perfect curvature of the feminine form observationally to appreciate, to aesthetically. Well, where the Greeks are appreciating the feminine form, and please give me a little pass here. The Hebrews were into the exploration of the feminine form, not merely to observe, but to experience. This is why the Bible says in Genesis chapter 4 that Adam knew his wife and they had a baby. It doesn't mean that he studied about female anatomy. It doesn't mean that he studied about the parameters of intercourse between a man and a woman and became aware that certain parts fit really nicely and in a complementary fashion. No, it, he knew. The Hebrew word here, yada. And this, whether we're talking about the riding of a horse or the, the, the being together with, with uh, the wife or with the spouse, from the Hebrew perspective, to know is to be committed not just intellectually, but to be committed in body. This is key. For John and for the, New for the New Testament writers and certainly for the Old Testament writers, if you wanted to know anything, you had to bring your body along for the ride. The Greeks could know observationally, they could know analytically, they could know in a detached, skeptical word. It's literally what the word skeptical means, to observe from a distance, to be non-committal. But for the Hebrew, to know something is to experience it. It's to get on the back of the horse, it's to hold your wife in your arms, and it's to know with such intimacy that the end product is a baby. The knowledge that God is inviting us into is an experiential intimacy that far transcends a mere Greek observation, analysis, or, or critique from afar. Now let me just show you this in John chapter 1. We're, on, we're doing great. We're on schedule to everyone's astonishment, including my own. <laughs> so we're in John chapter 1. Let me show you this. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. John has pointed out to the crowd, behold, the Lamb of God, two times. Uh, for one time, the second time's coming up right here, verse 35. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God, second time. There he is. Behold, the Lamb of God. And then verse 37, one of my favorite verses in the entire Gospel of John, and I got John Grawl, I got, uh, I got, John Lomaking here, and I got Lloyd Grawlman here. Let me tell you, the greatest compliment you can give any gospel preacher is found in verse 37. And these two disciples, when they heard John speak, they followed Jesus. That's what I want to be said about me. When David Asterix spoke, they followed Jesus. When John Lomaking spoke, they followed Jesus. When the Aussie pastor spoke, they followed Jesus. What we don't want is when the Aussie pastor spoke, they followed the Aussie pastor. When Pastor Lomaking spoke, they uh, spoke, they followed John Lomaking. When David Asherick spoke, they followed David Asherick. No, what we're after is when we speak, you follow Jesus. When John said, behold the Lamb of God, they're like, hey, th we know that you've been the forerunner. You've been the announcer. You've been the one that's been preparing the way. So, so great hanging out, great spending time together. We're going with the real deal. Verse 37, when these two disciples heard him speak, they followed Jesus. There is no greater compliment that can be given to a preacher of the gospel that when, other than that when he spoke, they followed Jesus. When she spoke, they followed Jesus. Verse 38, then they turned and seeing him, they said, uh, uh, then Jesus turned and seeing them following, this is key, they begin to follow. Ah. They don't say, 
What was he wearing? How did he conduct himself? Tell us more about him, John. No, they're Hebrews. If you're going to get to know something, this is key, your body's got to go. Your will has got to go. Your frame has got to go. And so they begin to, what do they begin to do? They begin to fall. Their body is moving, not just their mind. They're not just on an intellectual journey to some, you know, uh, place, some, some scene of, of knowledge, some ascent of knowledge. No, it says they begin to follow. Jesus senses their following. He, he sees what's happening here, and he turns to them, and he says, what are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, they don't yet know, which is to say, teacher, where, where are you staying? And Jesus said, these three words can change your life. Come and see. And here you have the essence of the Hebrew, no. Come and see. Come and see. Come is an invitation to proximity. It's an invitation to intimacy. Come. Come along for the journey. Come walk beside me. Come sleep in camp with me. Come warm your hands with me by the fire. Come along. Come with me and see, and, and implicit here in the sea is hear and smell and taste and touch. In fact, in fact, this very same John who wrote the first epistle of John, I'll just fast forward this, just listen to this, I'll just read it for you here. This is 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, so this is the epistle of John, one of the letters of John, five chapters, listen to this. That which we have heard from the beginning, which, uh, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which our hands have handled concerning the word of life. This life was manifested. We have seen, we bear witness, we declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was manifested to us, which we have seen and we heard, we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. He falls over himself when he's writing to his church, very likely the church in Ephesus, to say, we touched Jesus, we heard Jesus, we handled Jesus, we saw, we saw, we saw. Let me translate all of that. He says, we experienced Jesus with our body. And we know. We came and saw. We came and experienced. We did not observe from afar. We are not Greeks in the university. We are not Greeks in the academy. We're Hebrews. We didn't observe the horse. We got on the horse. We didn't appreciate the feminine form. We explored the feminine form. We didn't simply say he looked like a Messiah. We followed Messiah. Come and see. Come and see. Verse 39. So they came and saw they came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon, and he said to him, We have found the Messiah. Now this is fascinating. The, 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 the account is so sparse. It's so skeletal. It, there's so little detail here. We, we do not know why he's convinced. The text gives us no indication as to why he could have the degree of certainty that he here has. It never tells us. But something happened. And we're left to imagine, to, we're allowed, uh, to let our imagination run a little wild. What happened? I mean, certainly it couldn't have just been the act of saying, come and see. But that's not persuasive in and of itself. Something happened, something confirmational, something miraculous. And this is where I'm going to go with this. Just keep watching with me here. He first found his own brother, Simon, and he said, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. Verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You will be called Cephas, which is translated to stone. The following day, Jesus is now, his disciples are growing. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee and he found Philip and he said to him, follow me. This is the analog of come and see. Follow me. Not look at me, not listen to me, not observe me. Follow me. Follow me. Come and see. Bring your body Bring your corpse, bring your eyes, bring your, your hands, and come. put your feet behind my feet, and let's go. Come and follow me. Verse 44, now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael, and he said to him, We have found him of whom the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. A second instance where there's this, this certainty, this, this unassailable certainty. We found Messiah. And, and yet, no textual indication as to what happened. 
Simply follow me. How did they know? They, they, they were not idiots. They were, they were not perfectly credulous. There was something happened, but we're not alerted as to what happened. John is getting us hints here. Now, you'll see where I'm driving at this, and we're about ready to land this. This is exciting. Verse 46. Then Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip now said to him, he repeats the Messianic call, Come and see. Something had happened. When, when, when he had come and saw, that he said, trust me, just, just, just trust me, you got to come see. You just, you just got to come. You just got to come. We found him. We've got Messiah. Yeah, 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 but can any good thing come out of it? Just come and see. Trust me on that. This is great. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said, ah, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you, how do you know me? Now, this is a fascinating little turn that I'm just going to dwell on momentarily. So far in John chapter 1, the world did not know. The Jewish crowd did not know. John the Baptist does not know. Nobody knows. But you know what John says? There is somebody who does know. While we don't know him, he knows us. And when Nathaniel comes walking forward, Messiah looks at him and says, I'm in the world. I made the world. No one in the world knows me. But behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And Nathaniel asks the question. He says, how do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, this sermon could be titled Gasping or Grasping, but it could also be called You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet. Verse 49, Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. He had a very, sh a very small, a very shallow threshold of belief. That's what Jesus says. He's like, are you kidding? You found that persuasive? Verse 50, Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? You ain't seen nothing yet. You will see greater things than these. You find this persuasive? Let me tell you this. And then the last verse. Most assuredly, I say to you, this is a reference to Jacob's ladder. Hereafter, you will see the he heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. Friends, let's just wrap this up. It's so powerful. The Hebrew way of knowing is an experiential knowing. It's the, it's the knowing of body, mind, soul, and will. It's the knowing of experience. It's the knowing of discipleship. It's the knowing of following. And a really cool thing happens. When you begin to come, when you begin to see, when you begin to follow, you get the knowledge. It doesn't go the other way. We could wish... That, that we'll have enough information, there'll be enough, and, and God will satisfy our intellectual curiosity. He'll pass our threshold of belief to such a degree that we'll say, okay, now I have all the evidence I need. Now I'm persuaded, and I'll follow. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. What God says is, follow, and in the going comes the knowing. In the going comes the knowing. It will never work to try and perceive or apprehend or grasp God from a Greek perspective. This is why there will be people who will read the whole of the Bible. They'll read all of the works of the fathers. They can read all the writings of Ellen White. They can absorb themselves in an intellectual, analytical, observational quest to know God and still be on the fence. There are PhDs who know far more than you and I know in terms of the, the exegetical content of Scripture or the historical content or the systematic content of Scripture, and they themselves are unmoved by the observational, analytical, historical knowledge that they possess. Now, this certainly is not the case with all theologians. I know some theologians who are devote, uh, d devout, committed followers of Jesus, but the point is this, being aloof from, distant from, disconnected from God, and thinking that you just need one more miracle, one more sign, one more indication. John's going to get there, by the way. John's going to get there. John is going to show again and again and again the futility of signs and how signs do not satisfy because mere miracles cannot create faith, John is going to tell us. Mere miracles can actually corrode faith. But there is something that creates faith, and that's come and see. Follow me. And when you take your body, when you take your mind, when you take your frame, when you take your will, when you take your finances, when you take your job, when you take your life, and you orient your life 
and your will and your whole being toward following Jesus, trust me on this, you will see greater things than these. You will have confirmation after confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. In fact, the very next thing that happens in John chapter 2 is this amazing confirmation that all those that followed got to see water turn miraculously to wine. And here's the point. If they don't follow and see, that's only a story. It's only a hearsay. It's only a rumor. But if you're there, if you followed, now you get the miraculous confirmation. A lot of people think, if I get confirmation, I'll follow, but it doesn't work like that. You follow and get confirmation because the knowing comes through the going. You got to go. You want to know? You want to determinative, definitive knowledge, experiential knowledge and confidence and assurance that God is your Father, that Jesus is your Savior, and that you have eternal life? You got to go. You got to orient your life. You've got to follow. You've got to know. And the whole of the Gospel of John is that knowing looks like going to a feast with Jesus. Knowing looks like having a conversation with Jesus. Knowing looks like sitting at a well with Jesus. Knowing looks like eating a meal with Jesus. Knowing looks like being healed by Jesus. Knowing looks like doing life with Jesus. And I want to tell you, if you're one of them tonight here who are on the periphery the fringes, the fence of faith. You know what Jesus says to you tonight? Jesus says, come and see. You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. Come and see. And in the coming is the confidence. In the coming is the confirmation. Jesus invites you. Come on down, John. Come on down and sing for us. Jesus invites you not to merely grasp, but to stand in his presence and to, huh? Huh? to gasp at his glory, at his majesty. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let, let not the strong man glory in his strength, but let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me. Jesus came unto his own, and his own the world did not know him. But there were some that did, and Jesus says to you, and Jesus says to me, and Jesus says to your family, and Jesus says to your church, Come and see, come and see, because you ain't seen nothing yet. In shady green pastures So rich and so sweet God leads his dear children Along Where the water's cool flow He bathes the weary one's feet as God leads his children along. Some through the water and some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through his blood. Some through great sorrows, but God gives a song in the night seasons and all the day long. With sorrows before us and Satan opposed, God leads his dear children along. Through faith we will conquer 
will defeat all our foes as God leads his children along. He leads some through the water and some through the flood, some through the fire, but Yet God gives a song in our night season. He speaks in our night seasons. Then all the day. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, uh, you lead. You lead us in different ways and yet in the same way. You lead us with good intention. You lead us with a desire to save us, to know us, and to experience us for eternity. Father, you spoke the word Jesus in the flesh, incarnate, into this world for the purpose of communication, for the purpose of knowing and being known. Father, the prayer of my heart is that we would be unsatisfied with a mere analysis of faith, with a mere apprehension of spirituality, with a, with a mere awareness of biblical truth. Father, transition us to a place of whole body following, of being absorbed, mind, body, soul, will, and intellect in following you, in knowing you. Father, we don't want to merely grasp. We want to stand in your presence as you work confirmational miracles and gasp. <gasps> God is real. God is alive. And God is working in my life, in my home, in my workplace, in my family. Father, forgive us where we've been satisfied with a grasping and help us to dig deeper and to long for that gasping, that, that experiential knowledge of who you are. Father, you invite us to know you. You invite us to know your son and you invite us to believe. Father, may the gospel of John be successful in our experience. For he himself said, I wrote these things that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that in believing you may have life in his name. Father, give us that life. Give us Jesus is our prayer in his name. Let everyone say, Amen. I want to thank uh, Pastor Ashrick. I'm not sure about you, but I want to come and see. I actually want to go home and read the whole book of John again. <laughs> I'm very inspired. Um, and I always enjoy your preaching, Pastor. And tonight, no different. Beautiful message. Now, look, I want to thank Pastor Lomakang too for his beautiful music. Amen. Thank you. Um, I just want to give you a warning as we leave. This is not a theological warning. It's just a practical warning. We have never, in three and a half years, filled this church completely. Tomorrow we're going to smash every record because there are 600 people coming here. So I want to give you the faithful because you're here tonight, amen? amen? I want to give you a head start on this. Registration opens at 8.30. The church starts at 10. The closer you get here at 8, the more chance you've got of getting inside because if you're not inside, you'll be outside the doors of the ark. And you'll be looking inside. And it's not as good out as it is in. So what time are you going to be here tomorrow? Well, 
Someone said six o'clock. Well, I won't be here at six o'clock, but <laughs> David Ashrick might be. But <laughs> look, have a good night. Plan to come for the day. We've got a beautiful lunch tomorrow. We're going to have a fabulous concert in the afternoon, and Pastor Ashrick's going to finish off at 4:30. See you tomorrow. Have a happy Sabbath evening. God bless you.